Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar to review Education Trust's recent report, Segregation Forever, the Continued Underrepresentation of Black and Latino Undergraduates at the nation's 101 most selective colleges and universities. While the COVID-19 pandemic and the killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, Ahmed Aubrey, and countless others have shined a bright light on systemic racism in America, there is less awareness um, of the many ways systemic racism limits educational opportunity for Black and Latino people. This report exposes the continued and systemic exclusion of Black and Latino students from the most selective public colleges and universities in the country. We are challenging these institutions, the nation's top 101, to finally reflect the nation's racial diversity, opening the door for Black and Latino students across the country. With that, let's get started by hearing from the author of this report, Dr. Andrew Nichols, Senior Director of Higher Education Research and Data Analytics at the Education Trust. Andrew? Thank you, Jordan. Um, good morning, everybody, and happy Friday. Um, pleased to be able to share you know, the findings from this report um, and hope for an engaging Q&A at the end. Um, also excited to have my colleague, Tiffany Jones, um, on the call as well, on the webinar as well, um, talk some of the policy implications of this work. Um, so the report, Segregation Forever, uh, really looks at uh, Black and Latino enrollment at the nation's 101 most selective colleges and universities. Um, you know, we identified these 101 selective institutions looking at measures of selectivity, such as uh, standardized tests and things of that nature. And if you'd like more details on this, we can talk about it in the Q&A. But uh, we wanted to kind of look at the current act, uh, state of access. So what, what do the numbers look like now? And then also how have things changed for Black and Latino students since the year 2000? Um, what we do is we essentially compare the percentage of Black and Latino undergraduates on each campus to the percentage of Black and Latino 18 to 24 year olds in the state. Um, and to be fair to institutions, we didn't just look at all 18 to 24 year olds, we looked at 18 to 24 year olds who were college eligible. Well, they had to have at least a high school diploma or GED equivalent, and uh, we did not count folks who had more than an AA, because um, they would already have a bachelor's degree. So um, in this report, we provide each institution with grades and scores uh, for Black and Latino student access. Um, we, in the report's main analysis, we look at the data in the aggregate, but if you want to look at specific grades and scores for institutions, uh, you can find that in appendix tables A and B. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, let's talk a bit about why selective colleges and universities um, are the focus of this report. Um, and part of the reason is that uh, many of these institutions have more resources than other institutions. So for, as we're thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic and you know, the ability for institutions to continue serving um, their students, these are some of the, uh, the, the more privileged institutions. You know, they're, they're gonna have the additional resources, whether it's more funding or um, more um, endowment funds and things of that nature to help serve students and, and have better choices about how to really handle this pandemic. Um, also, um, we know that students who go to these institutions are more likely to graduate because these institutions have more resources. Oftentimes, they're better able to offer the wraparound support services, more financial aid and things of that nature that really help support students from matriculation all the way through uh, graduation. Um, what we also know is that, you know, folks who attend these institutions and complete a degree also make more in the labor market and they're more likely to have influential positions in business and um, in politics as well. Um, and what the data show us is that these selective colleges and universities, these public selectives, excuse me, um, do not really serve black, Latino, and low income undergraduates. Um, if you look at their enrollments, you'll see that um, white students are overrepresented as well as students from high income backgrounds and students who are from out of state. Um, and the, the main issue here is that, you know, these 101 colleges and universities are tax exempt, taxpayer supported. And so um, we think that all public colleges and universities should represent the racial and ethnic diversity of the taxpaying residents in their state. It's important for Black and Latino students to have access to these institutions that offer a tremendous opportunity for upward social mobility. Next slide, please. 
So if you don't remember anything else about uh, this presentation, um, here are just some, some high level findings that uh, you can commit to, commit to memory. Um, what we saw in the data is that there's been very little progress um, since 2000. Um, you know, by and large, um, institutions are not accessible now. And in many instances, some have gotten worse since uh, the turn of the century. Um, about half of the institutions are in Ds and F for both Black and Latino student access. There's about fit over 55 or so um, institutions uh, were kind of on table one, which is uh, kind of our worst, um, our least accessible uh, public institutions. Um, now, by and large, what we've seen is that uh, Black students have uh, less access than they did in 2000. So access has actually regressed um, for uh, black students and we see more uh, institutions having uh, failing grades um, in, in the current year, 2017, um, versus what they had back in 2000. Um, and what we have seen is a little bit of kind of positive news for Latino students. And I'll get into this in a bit more detail, but uh, the enrollment at all of these institutions went up for Latino students. Um, but what we do see is that the gains in enrollment at these institutions did not surpass the gains in the population growth in those individual states. And so we can talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. So we're going to first cover the uh, findings for Black students, and uh, then we'll get into the findings for Latino students. So if you look at the data for Black students, what you're going to see if you focus on that donut chart on the far right is that dark maroon or red um, piece that's about 77%. So 77% of the 101 institutions in our study got an F grade. Um, for black student representation. As you see, if you look at the brown um, piece with the A on it, only 9% got an A and only 1% got a B. And so you're seeing a significant amount of institutions um, you know, not pulling the weight in terms of enrolling uh, representative share of black uh, students on, the, on these campuses. Um, also, it's one thing to note is that uh, some of the worst institutions in terms of black student access were located in the South. And so um, we looked at about, there were about 32 institutions in the South um, in about 14 states. Um, and nearly all of them had uh, failing grades for uh, black students. Only about three, which were in uh, West Virginia and Kentucky, had um, non-failing grades. And um, it should be noted that West Virginia and Kentucky have kind of the lowest share of black uh, residents in, in, in the South. So those are the states without a, a lot of black residents. Uh, next slide, please. So here, um, I want to kind of point your attention to the, to the pie chart at the top. Um, and what you see is about, you know, 43% of institutions had a gain in Black student enrollment on their particular campuses. And if you kind of look at that bar chart on the left, you'll see that about 37% had kind of marginal gains. So even when there were gains, the gains were kind of less than two percentage points. Uh, the bad news is that about, you know, 58 or approaching 60% of institutions had decreases in the shares of Black students. Um, also, key, key to note here is that when you look at the decreases or the average decreases, you'll see that, again, uh, some of the decreases were marginal with about 39% having um, a decrease below, you know, two percentage points, but you also see about 15% having a decrease that uh, approached five percentage points and was higher than two percentage points. So here again, you see some, some problems with there being um, you know, less access over time. Next slide. So here, um, what we wanted to do was kind of put the, um, the change in enrollment within the context of the, uh, the state's kind of demographic changes over time. So if you look at the red portion of the graph, uh, you'll see that slightly more than 45% of institutions had a decrease in the percentage of black students, even though the percentage of um, black residents in that particular state went up. So this is the worst possible outcome you can have. And again, it's approaching half of the institutions in our study. Um, and if you look at the gray portion of the graph, uh, you see that roughly 30% of institutions saw an increase in the percentage of black students, but this increase failed to keep pace with the increase in the black population in that particular state. So this is a good outcome, but it's certainly not ideal. Um, now, if you look at the green piece, this is the most positive outcome you can have. Um, and here you see that about 14% 
of um, institutions saw an increase in the percentage of black students. And this increase actually surpassed the percentage of black residents in the state. And again, this is exactly what we need to see given that you know, since 2000, um, black students have been underrepresented. So you're probably going to need to, to kind of increase representation. Um, you're going to need to increase representation above what's happening in the demographic shift in the, country, in the nation, in the states, excuse me. Next slide. So we're going to kind of talk about the Latino findings. And generally what you'll see is that the findings for Latino students were a bit more positive. But um, again, there's still a lot of room to uh, progress to be made here, and I'll, and I'll cover some of that next. Um, so here, um, if you look at that donut chart on the right, um, you'll see that about half of the uh, institutions in this particular study received failing grades for Latino students. So again, not as many as Black students, but still half of these institutions have uh, failing grades for, black, for Latino student access. Um, and you see more positive outcomes when you look at who received an A or a B. So about 14% of institutions uh, received an A and about 10% uh, of institutions um, received a B. Um, you know, again, we wanted to look at what was happening in the states that uh, lots of Latino students live. So we looked at the nine states that, um, that um, where 75% of the Latino population lives. And on average, the colleges and universities in those States were uh, less accessible. So you have about 27 of 37 institutions, which is about 73% received D and F grades for Latino student access. So here again, we're looking at kind of the change in enrollment uh, since the year 2000. Um, and here we see that each institution in the study uh, saw their percentage of Latino uh, enrollment increase. So that's, that's very good news. Um, and when you look at the gains, um, in most instances, uh, they were considerable. So nearly half of the institutions saw gains between two and five percentage points. Um, only about 44% of institutions saw gains that surpassed five percentage points. Um, this includes the turquoise and brown uh, portions of the donut chart. So you add that together, that's about 44%. Next slide, please. And so here again, what we wanted to do was put into context the, um, the change in enrollment and compare that to the change in demography in all those states. Um, and so as we mentioned previously, all of the institutions you know, saw their percentage of Latino students increase. And again, that's, that's positive. Um, but what we see here is if you look at the gray portion, about two thirds of those institutions that saw gains in Latino student enrollment um, did not see those gains surpass the gain, the uh, increase in Latino uh, residents in those particular states. So again, even though their enrollment was going up, it did not uh, match what was happening in, in the state in terms of Latino population growth. Um, but on a more positive note, we saw about 36% of institutions actually see their enrollment surpass population gains for Latinos. So that's, uh, that's a very good finding. And uh, just to be clear, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, um, when we're giving someone A, we're using a traditional grading scheme. So um, it's like if your score was in the 90s, you got an A, if your score was in the 70s, you got a C. Uh, if your score was uh, below 60, you got an F. Um, so just sort of for clarity there. But uh, here we're looking at kind of what would need to be done um, and how many additional Black and Latino students would be enrolled if these institutions we're actually enrolling a student body that matched the racial and ethnic diversity of those particular states. So here you see that the current enrollment at these, um, you know, 101 public selective colleges for black students is about 116,000. Um, now, if these institutions were actually enrolling a um, student body that matched the racial and ethnic diversity of their state, you'd see almost 308,000 black students on these particular campuses. So that's an additional you know, 100 and almost 92,000 uh, black students that should be enrolled. And that'd be a percent change of 166. So we're talking about doubling, um, more than doubling easily, the, um, the number of black students on those particular campuses. And um, if you look at what's happening with Latino students, again, you're seeing that uh, we go from about 257,000 Latino students to about 435,000 uh, Latino students. So that's an additional 180 three or 84,000 
uh, Latino students that would be on these 101 public selective colleges and universities or at these 101 uh, public uh, selective colleges and universities. And that's a percentage gain of about 70%. So here, I mean, just to give you kind of a larger picture of the scope, we're talking about adding nearly 200,000 for both black, 200,000 additional students for both black and Latino students. So the, the access crisis is real. And um, I know a lot of folks are focused on completion, but we've got to be also focused on what's happening with access. Because if we don't improve access for these students and they're typically um, you know, more likely to go to community colleges or, or for-profit institutions or even regional publics, we're gonna to continue to see some of the crisis with, um, with uh, completion and graduation rates as well. Because again, these institutions have the resources to better support and care for students um, in, in various ways. So, with that said, I will pass uh, this along to Tiffany Jones, who's going to talk about some of the policy implications of this work. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Drew, uh, for that overview. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in today. What I'll do is just talk about a few things that institutions or colleges can do, that states can do, that the federal government can do. Uh, to try and make it so that if this analysis is done and you know, let's say a decade from now that the results are much better than what we've seen in terms of the, the trends in time over time so far. Um, so first I want to start off with focusing on what colleges can do. Um, first, colleges can adopt goals to increase the ac college access for Black and Latino students specifically. Um, some colleges, some selective colleges have come together to adopt goals to increase uh, their enrollment of low-income students, and we applaud these efforts and think it's important to be intentional. Uh, we're just suggesting here that you know colleges should take the same approach and perspective with their increasing the enrollment of Black students and Latino students. Again, um, this matters because often these colleges that have resources are able to achieve their goals, especially when they're trying to increase their enrollment of, let's say, out-of-state students or international students or even uh, particular athletes. Um, you know, once they set a particular goal and put their resources behind it, they're able to achieve it. And so we think that that's an important place to start. Um, it's also important to think about how to increase access to high quality guidance counselors. And here, of course, this requires uh, work in the, the K-12 system, but also in higher ed where one guidance counselors are prepared, trained, certified uh, as well. But that is a responsibility of, of both systems to make sure uh, it's no longer um, a fact that students often have access to uh, police officers, but not guidance counselors in their schools. In fact, there's 1.7 million students in schools right now um, with a police officer and no guidance counselor. Uh, and this has to change because it's important, especially if students are first in their family to attend college, that they have someone to support them in understanding their, their college options to make sure that they're prepared and on track uh, for those opportunities. Um, so again, it, it's important that they have access to guidance counselors, but high quality. And high quality isn't just what university they were trained at. It means that they were trained to understand the, the dynamics of racial uh, injustice in this country, um, address racial bias and all of the other factors that might preclude um, guidance counselors who understand higher education um, that might deter uh, black and brown students from even applying to some selective colleges and universities because they perceive them as not um, having talent or ability to succeed. Um, and so again, it's important that higher ed does its part to make sure that they're, they're training guidance counselors with a, a critical understanding of uh, their role in advancing racial justice. Um, also, uh, and colleges have to rethink their recruitment strategies. You know, there's been research that suggests that too often um, some of the most selective public colleges are not even recruiting from local high schools that serve uh, more Black and Latino students. Um, and again, this would have to change when colleges want to enroll more out-of-state students, they go out-of-state and recruit them. And so they should also do the same thing for if they aim to increase their enrollment of Black and Latino students. Um, there's also this uh, role of standardized testing, um, and it's important that colleges uh, consider making uh, standardized tests optional, try to reduce the emphasis of uh, the, the role of standardized tests in their admissions decisions. Um, 
This is important because, you know, tests like the SAT or the ACT are really great at predicting income, um, which means, again, students with the, the most resources do really well on these tests, uh, but they aren't the strongest predictor of whether or not a student can even be successful in college. In fact, uh, there's been research that suggests that grades and the actual courses students take are much better predictors of these outcomes. And so instead, um, overemphasizing the role of these tests in college admissions uh, can create uh, more barriers, maybe perhaps deter students from applying or from being considered uh, for admissions. Uh, the good news is that colleges have a learning opportunity uh, with the current pandemic. Many selective colleges, including some Ivy League institutions, have uh, committed to going test optional um, temporarily during this crisis. And hopefully it's an opportunity uh, for colleges to see the impact that this could have on creating uh, more access for Black and Latino students in particular. Um, it's also important not just to take things out of the what's emphasized in admissions, but it's uh, critical to think about, well, what do you focus on instead? Uh, and our advice, our guidance is to actually look at race specifically, think about the racial makeup of the class, um, of the institution, and the background of the student when thinking about admissions decisions. Uh, one of the, I guess, strongest barriers or um, opposition to that might be the concern about, is that legal, is that prohibited? Uh, and of course, there's a, a national conversation about uh, using race and um, policy period, um, but especially even at the state level. Um, so we also advise states to uh, remove any bans that they have on affirmative action. And the reason being that these statewide bans can signal to college leaders that their efforts to target, support, and improve the success of students of color are prohibited. Um, and so again, right now, there's about nine states that currently have a ban, uh, the most recently uh, uh, Idaho uh, in March 2020 of this year, of course, um, implemented a, a ban on affirmative action. Uh, as a student organizer uh, in Michigan, uh, this is one of the first policy issues I worked on. And what I do remember is kind of the chilling effect, um, the concern and the worry of higher ed leaders who actually did care a lot about being able to admit and support uh, Black and Latino students, but being concerned about what these bans meant for their ability to be explicit. And what we do know is that race conscious, or, I'm sorry, colorblind policies alone uh, cannot close uh, gaps in outcomes, even though they can be helpful in some ways. And so it's important that uh, campus leaders have all the resources and strategies available uh, to them to be able to uh, meet their ambitious goals of in increasing their enrollment of Black and Latino students. The good news is that there it has been some movement to, to change this. Um, uh, recently, uh, there was an attempt to remove the ban in Washington that lost by a narrow vote and the state of California, the first to uh, adopt a statewide ban on affirmative action, will um, have an opportunity to remove that ban um, depending on what voters decide in November. Um, also, just a couple more things. It's important for both states and institutions to increase financial aid to Black and Latino students. For example, white families have 10 times the wealth of Black families. This means fewer resources to fill the gaps, pay for college, um, and all of the, the needs that students will have in terms of their full cost of attendance. Um, and I do recognize in this time of economic crisis that states and institutions may be facing budget cuts. And so what this means, how is how they spend their dollars will be more important than ever, that they may have to make some tough calls and prioritize uh, their investments for the students who need it the most. Um, and again, public four-year institutions have spent at least 32 billion in financial aid dollars between 2001 and 2017 on students who lack financial, aid, financial need. Um, so it's just an example of, you know, Universities may not be able to add on additional scholarships for Black and Latino students on top of everything else, um, but what they may need to do is actually scale back their investment um, based on their investment in merit aid that's usually based on standardized test scores like the SAT, which results in dollars being spent on students from families who can already pay for college. Um, and so I just want to hit on also we've been talking a lot about enrollment. Um, but enrollment is not inclusion. Um, graduation can, you know, and can be a marker of success. But the question is, at what cost? What is it that Black and Latino students experience when they're on campus? So it's important to also improve campus racial climates, uh, because poor racial climates can negatively influence students' academic and social engagement, sense of belonging, 
chances at completing a degree. And so uh, in higher ed too, for too long, those conversations have been isolated to student affairs, um, which certainly can make a difference for students living on campus. Um, but it's also important to think about what happens in the classroom, particularly making sure that there's diverse faculty and staff, that there are content in the courses that represent the experiences, expertise, and contributions of Black and Latino students as well, um, making sure there's culturally responsive pedagogy being used as well. All of these things can impact students' academic self-concept, their confidence, career aspirations, and opportunities. Um, and then finally, we've laid out a number of things we want institutions to do, uh, but it's most important that there's some entities that provide resources and, and hold them responsible. And so at the state level, uh, states have an opportunity, whether it be through outcomes-based funding policies, where they are distributing um, dollars to colleges based on the priorities that matter to them. We suggest that uh, colleges should be held responsible for providing access to Black and Latino students. So this would mean greater funds for those colleges committed to providing access and fewer dollars for those who don't. Uh, states are already doing this for low-income students in many cases, um, but often uh, race is left out. It's either optional or not at the core of these policies. Um, some exceptions uh, of states who have included uh, the enrollment of Black students or Latino students are New Jersey and Louisiana and, and recently the, the state of Colorado. Um, and so it, that's one thing that states can do, but also the federal government, like states, the federal government provides funding for higher ed in exchange for that funding. They should expect more from colleges. Um, that's not a new idea, but too often that conversation is limited to student success and outcomes. Uh, the data presented today demonstrates how important it is to make sure there's also resources that are targeted to the colleges providing access uh, to uh, Black and Latino students and perhaps limiting new funding for colleges that continue to exclude them. Um, so I will stop right there so we can uh, move on to hopefully our question and answers. Um, Thank you, Tiffany. Um, so what is next with this report? What can we do? Um, we did want to provide you, our national partners, with a bit of an overview of how we are getting this report out to uh, to advocates, to the general public, to these institutions so that they know um, about this really public education crisis and uh, what these recommendations for improving um, are. So first, uh, we are working with state advocates to present these findings, split them up um, to focus in on the universities that impact their state. Um, so if you have advocates that you think would be interested in this, please uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we would love to share this with as many people as possible. We've also shared these findings with the heads of the institutions that are um, represented on this report, as well as with key state uh, policy officials uh, who have some sort of purview or overview of higher education policy. And thirdly, uh, we will be working with student organizations at some of the campuses reflected on this report in the fall uh, coming into the new year so that students are aware of where their universities stand on this issue and can play an active role in pushing their campus administrations to do better. Um, I do also want to open it up to my colleague, Phil, who runs our higher education communications and who has been doing a great job lifting this report out so that we can share these numbers and findings with as many people as possible. Phil, do you want to share and comment a little bit more about that side of things? For sure. Thanks, Jordan. Hi, everybody. Uh, a few things for me, uh, just some notes on messaging, social media, and press. So in terms of messaging, um, hope you think some of what you heard today was compelling. It certainly is to me the, the fact that Drew pointed out uh, these colleges would have to add nearly 200,000 black students, nearly 200,000 Latino students to match the racial makeup of their states is, is tragic and important for folks to understand. Um, what Tiffany mentioned about uh, that being the case, enrollment is not inclusion and campus racial climate really matters, for example. Um, if you want any help 
uh, pulling messaging from this report into what you're doing, whether that's your, your policy agenda, an op-ed you're writing, uh, a speaking engagement you or a principal is, is doing, feel free to reach out, let us know. We're, we're at the ready to help you integrate messaging from this report into, into what you're doing. In terms of social media, um, we've been sharing from our accounts, so follow EdTrust, uh, just at EdTrust on Twitter. Uh, we're also on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, if you would like, we're having a Twitter chat on this uh, in September. So September 16th at 3 p.m., uh, EdTrust will host a Twitter chat organized around uh, this report. Would love uh, your uh, engagement, participation, if you're interested in being a co-host, um, super interested in, in that as well. So reach out to us about that. Again, September 16th at 3 p.m. Let us know uh, if you want to be part of that in advance. Um, if you don't already have it, we'll be sure to send you the digital toolkit for this report that includes some sample uh, tweets and posts you could, you could use to help promote it. As Jordan mentioned, this is not just a flash in the pan release, uh, but something that we really want to keep up the momentum on uh, going into the fall. Uh, especially as, as colleges uh, re-engage students, uh, whether that's on campus or virtually. And finally with press, we're psyched that we've got good uh, response from National Trade Press so far, uh, pieces in Inside Higher Ed, the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, Heckinger Report, um, we've got actually another inquiry today. Uh, so that's all great. We're definitely gonna be keeping up the focus on um, uh, media relations, especially uh, in states, kind of state level, local media, and uh, college media as we get into uh, college, the fall college season. Um, if you're interested in teaming with us on any kind of press engagement, definitely let us know whether that's, you know, recommending somebody from EdTrust uh, to join you on an interview that you're doing or co-authoring an op-ed that, uh, that we could pitch together, um, uh, you know, teamed up with one of our experts, uh, definitely open to that. Um, and, you know, we are, here to be uh, kind of good good partners um, on this work and and everything else that uh, that we're doing that connects with what you're doing. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, Bill. Um, I, I do want to open it up and have people start utilizing the Q and A function on your screen. Uh, if you have questions, please type them into that Q and A chat now, and we'll get to them. Um, while we wait for those to come in, I did also want to flag that. All the things Phil said, what's represented on your screen. Um, we are working with state advocates on doing that the same. So as Phil said, we want to be as helpful in equipping people to utilize this report as a tool for advocacy uh, to make changes to this really uh, tragic issue. Um, Question to uh, our panelists, specifically Tiffany and Drew, while we're waiting for other questions to come in, is there one thing, either in something you would ask people to do to take away from this report, or one outstanding item that you want to make sure resonates with folks uh, regarding the report findings that you would ask people to, to keep with them after today? And Jordan, this is Phil. Just I'll mention that your audio sounded different now than it did before. A little robotic, folks might um, might find. I don't know if there's a way you can kind of unplug and plug back in as um, as Drew and Tiffany think about a, a call to action they'd they'd share um, uh, as you do that. I'm happy to jump in, um, and then of course, Drew, please. I think one main takeaway here for me is one this analysis was about public colleges and universities um and so sometimes there's a public perception that folks understand that there's certain parts of higher education that aren't accessible and they think about the ivy leagues for example but it's important for them to know that there's communities whose tax dollars whose labors uh, help build and sustain that are continuing to be excluded and also we have not achieved access yet So as much as we think it's important to focus on student success and outcomes 
um, that access isn't over. And that's why, for example, with outcomes-based funding, we say if you're going to redo a funding formula to achieve state goals, access for Black and Brown students in particular has to be a part of the things incentivized. But sometimes it gets looked over because, again, folks assume uh, that we've already achieved access in higher education. And the results of this report uh, just demonstrate that that's just not true for um, Black and Latino students in particular. Yeah, I'll just kind of add on to what Tiffany was saying is that, you know, I've, I've been on various panels and, and been in various conversations with different higher education experts. And I've heard people, you know, talk about how access has, has improved and, and we've kind of defeated the access problem. And, and that's just certainly not true. Um, what they're essentially doing is looking at some of the overall gains that we've seen over time for Black and Latino students in higher education, but they're not specifically looking at where uh, these Black and Latino students are enrolling. And so as we show here, um, it's not just kind of an access issue with, you know, as Tiffany mentioned, some of these Ivy League institutions, it's also like some public institutions, ones that are very well known and, and very well resourced. And, um, you know, for us, um, you know, we think that college and university leaders have to really kind of move beyond the rhetoric of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, they're, they're very good um, at kind of talking the talk, but what we don't see are the kind of the race conscious strategies and actions that are really necessary to kind of move the needle. And um, here, you know, we're simply talking about enrollment. As Tiffany mentioned, there's so many different other aspects of this. The least you can do you know, if you want to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, is ensure that there are enough Black and Latino students on your campus. And, and what we're seeing is here, um, you know, there simply aren't. So this is really just kind of the first step to, um, to kind of making, you know, their, their uh, college and universities, you know, places of inclusion, um, places where Black and Latino students uh, feel that they matter. And, um, and what we're seeing right now is that they're simply not doing it. And so that's all I think for, for me, the commitment to this, you know, that's, that's uh, policy recommendation number one is important. And again, you know, we've seen community colleges do this in California, working with uh, the USC's Race and Equity Center. You know, we've seen people do it with the University Innovation Alliance, you know, specifically focused on, you know, a uh, increase in the percentage of low income students, you know, they're very clear about that. Um, I just don't see why institutions uh, can't do the same thing for um, Black and Latino students particularly these four-year public selective institutions. Thank you, Drew. Um, Phil here again. Anybody else out there uh, have, I should say, of the attendees, anybody want to share uh, a reaction to what you've heard and seen or a question? We'll just kind of keep this open for one more minute in case anybody does. Feel free to post that in the chat or the Q&A, and uh, we'll wait just a minute in case anything else comes in. I will say that as people continue to think about any questions they may have, that on our landing page for this report, there is a data file. Um, and so this data file includes the information that is in appendix tables A and B. And so it allows you, and, and some additional information. So it allows you to kind of go in there and uh, really look at the, the individual data for each of these institutions, um, each of these 101 public selective institutions. Um, you know, you may want to look at some in your particular state or you may want to look at, you know, an institution that you attended. Um, so you may find that super interesting. Right. I'll just say I agree with you. Um, when you, you guys were talking to California folks uh, earlier this week and were able to say these particular uh, super selective public universities in California would have to add, I think it was 9,000 black students. That makes it really concrete. Uh, so folks can look at that data file and see on a state-by-state -state basis, how many are we talking about? How many of those 200,000 or so black students, Latino students each uh, that these colleges need to add? Uh, where, where do they need to be added in terms of, uh, in terms of the states? So I um, appreciate you putting that data file yeah. there and sharing that for folks who want to yeah. do that. And if you need help kind of navigating that, feel free to reach out, um, a Nichols at edtrust.org. It's my email there. So let's, let's wrap up here. Uh, thank you everybody for, for joining. Thanks especially uh, Drew and Tiffany for guiding us through the, the report, what you, what you found and what uh, you think needs to happen. 
Uh, just so everybody knows, we will follow up with an email that includes uh, everything we mentioned today, obviously links to the report, the press release, um, and, uh, and, and resources folks have, have mentioned. Uh, please stay in touch with us. Um, and again, that date for the Twitter chat, if you're interested, is September 16th at 3 p.m. Uh, thank you very much for joining and look forward to staying connected and keeping up the work. Thanks, everybody.